This is the new face of organized crime, and he's the godfather. I'm a cocaine cowboy, but I'm living in Georgia. In any community that has the availability of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, dangerous drugs, designer drugs, you can directly or indirectly connect it to Chapo. Joaquin Guzman Loera, better known as El Chapo, or Shorty, is officially the world's most powerful drug trafficker. Short man, big title. The Mexican drug cartels control these distribution cells throughout the United States, and in Mexico, and in Brazil, Europe, Australia even. From rags to riches, in less than a decade, he turned a startup operation into a multinational criminal empire. Chapo Guzman is like the Osama bin Laden of drug trafficking. But El Chapo has proven to be more elusive than bin Laden. He was captured in the 90s and managed to escape eight years later. El Chapo bribed his way out of uh, what was supposed to be a high security uh, penitentiary uh, in Mexico. Authorities in Mexico and the U.S. have tried to catch him, so far unsuccessfully. No será que el Chapo Guzmán es el narcotraficante más poderoso de todos los tiempos, porque lo protege el gobierno más poderoso del mundo. He always seems to vanish just in time, and even with the U.S. government on his trail, he's still a free man. He is the number one criminal operating in the world. Both dangerous and seductive, his myth grows as he evades the law. El papa de los Songs praise his dominance and sex appeal. Emerging as a leader of the Sinaloa cartel, one of the most violent of the Mexican drug game. Conspiracy theories, billionaire status, and relentless violence, ever-growing power. Mix it all and you have the ingredients of El Chapo's life. An unlikely rise from poor Mexican boy to CEO of crime. All we want to be is El Chapo. At least all the street niggas I know. That's why we decided to take this extraordinary move. There's no question that Guzman is public enemy number one. Chicago, America's third largest city. With almost 800,000 Hispanics, it's a stronghold to the shadow known as El Chapo. Here in Chicago, Chapo's really taken a hold because it is a foothold through the Midwest. But most importantly, we may have here the fourth or fifth largest Mexican population outside of Mexico. It allows Chapo's organized crime surrogates, quite frankly, to hide amongst tens of thousands of hardworking, law-abiding Mexican-Americans. In the 1930s, Al Capone was Chicago's public enemy number one. Today, that title is held by El Chapo, a man who has never set foot in this city. Guzman is by far the greater threat to the citizens of this community and the United States. This drug kingpin declared in 2006 that he wanted to make Chicago his distribution center, and he did. With the help of two of the most powerful gangs, the Latin Kings and the Gangster Disciples, he controls 80% of the heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and methamphetamine that floods Chicago netting him at least $3 billion a year. Primarily, the largest, most violent gang in the city is the Gangster Disciples. They are the ones, for the most part, uh, along with the Latin Kings, that control the movement of heroin on the streets of Chicago. Approximately 100,000 documented street gang members. Chicago, the Midwest, and border cities have all been heavily tapped by the Sinaloa Cartel, El Chapo's criminal organization. Arizona is one of the busiest areas for drug trafficking along the uh, U.S.-Mexico border. Tucson border patrol sector accounts for 49 percent of the seizures along the southwest border when it comes to uh, marijuana. 
but his reach is even bigger. The Sinaloa cartel doesn't only control the Arizona southwest border. They also have the wholesale contacts of Colombian cocaine because they also control the passageways from Colombia into the United States via Guatemala because the drugs come in through those states as well by air, by boat, and by land transit. The purpose of the transnational criminal organizations, it's profit. It's getting the product from point A to point B, whether that's narcotics or whether that's people. Uh, it's just getting the product from point A uh, to point B. There is not right now a more significant, powerful trafficker than Chapo. He makes El Capone, John Gotti look like Boy Scouts. To many, El Chapo is a folk hero, a cultural icon followed by thousands. Songs praising his lifestyle are popular on both sides of the border. This team of investigative reporters from Univision spent months digging into his life to unravel the true El Chapo and to understand how a man who appears to be everywhere remains so elusive. El Chapo is everywhere and they're not embarrassed or shy about saying no, no, no. This is not Chapo the narco trafficker, drug kingpin. This is El Chapo, our friend. And why are you here? He could be a colorful guy, but we, we, we shouldn't forget that he is a very violent guy. To see all this chaos and all this destruction and death and come from this one guy, you go, oh my God. I mean, he's everywhere, so we could go everywhere and do a story about El Chapo. When we come back, the Univision team takes us into the heart of El Chapo country in Mexico, to the capital of his worldwide drug empire. Sinaloa, Mexico, the home state of El Chapo Guzman. It's been the center of Mexican drug production for nearly 200 years. The poppies grown here were turned into morphine during World War II. After the war, they fed the opium trade. Today, it's all about pot. Um, Gerardo, I'm gonna start with you since you're the leader of this cartel, as you said. Yes. <laughs> How did um, El Chapo start in the drug business? The family of El Chapo, as many of the families of this area, were devoted to uh, growing marijuana. And he used to go with his father to sell the marijuana to this point where drug dealers buy the product. But the father spent all the money that he made by drinking and paying prostitutes. And at the age of 15, he started his own crop. So he got into the drug business when he was 15 years old? 15 years old, and then he managed to know the big bosses of, the, of that time. Gerardo and the Univision investigative team went into the heart of Sinaloa in pursuit of El Chapo's trail. It was immediately clear he was watching. He controls every movement, every movement. You go by and there's people sitting in a corner and they just look at you and go by. You see the radios. They're sitting next to a truck in a, in, in a, on the side of the road and you see them just go like this. He has like a 200 people around him. He has 200 his people protecting him. Protecting him. So there is no way that you could have gone to his hometown without his knowledge and his consent. No way. Were you nervous at all going there? Sometimes, yes. yes. I was very nervous. 
To enter Badiraguato, the small town near El Chapo's hometown of Latuna, required special help from a source whose identity we're not allowed to disclose. How did you get the green light to go ahead and do it? He gave us the authorization to be in the Chapo's land. El Chapo was so aware of the team's presence that he even sent them a direct message. He said, you're wrong. The Chapo's land is Mexico, not that piece of the, of the country, of the whole country. Why? Why do you think he agreed to it? El Chapo wanted an interview with us. So he told this woman, make all the arrangements to get the interview. And we were very close to get the interview, but at the end he said, I give the interview and uh, if you allow me to review whatever I said after the interview, and we said, no. We haven't done that in Univision for presidents, ministers, or whatever. We are not going to do it for a drug trafficker. So. To many in Sinaloa, El Chapo is not just a drug trafficker. He's a hero. They see him as a modern day Robin Hood. They like him because he came from poverty. And the myth is that he helps the poor people of the Sierra, the mountain range where he grew up. He mocks the United States, and they love that. I mean, he's, he, here's a kid who came from a very poor neighborhood in Mexico, first grade education, and he's known all over the world now. And like you said, they think that he's mocking the United, mocking the United States, and nobody's been able to capture him. They caught Osama bin Laden in another continent, and he's across the border, and they can't catch him. So while filming this, you kept on hearing people referring to him as sort of the Robin Hood who's bringing um, money and food to the people. That's, that's his reputation, really. But the only thing that they, got, that they got from him is protection and some uh, contracts for the uh, souls of the marijuana, but that's it. Because the region where he's from is still really poor. It one of the poorest uh, regions of the, uh, Mexico, according to the Mexican government. In his early 20s, he was in charge of the airplane operations for Mexican drug kingpin Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. El Chapo Guzman was one of the figures. I mean, he certainly was a, what I would call a key player within the Sinaloa cartel. Uh, but I don't even think at that time he was yet the major figure. He would become that in the 90s. After Felix Gallardo's capture in 1989, El Chapo slowly took control of the entire Sinaloa cartel. Over the last uh, 15 years or so, Guzman has become the head of the Sinaloa cartel. The war between cartels hasn't stopped. The trail of blood from criminals and innocent victims keeps growing. According to the latest death toll in Mexico, over 77,000 people have died in drug-linked violence since 2006. Particularly people that are involved, not just in drug trafficking, but kidnapping, extortion, and all the other kinds of organized crime, human trafficking, that the major cartels in Mexico that are based in Mexico are involved in. El Chapo Guzman has taken over the organization, so he's certainly been engaged uh, in a lot of murders of people and a lot of violence. And no one is immune from El Chapo. Well, for me personally, while I was on the border, uh, there was a veiled threat from Chapo to chop, chop my head off. He'd done it before, leaving the heads of several members of his rival cartel, Los Zetas, in Nuevo Laredo, Zetas territory. He also left a written threat, signed, Sincerely, El Chapo. Chapo has an organization that is second to no one in terms of the power, the, the corruption uh, techniques that he has. Is the most wanted drug lord in the world. Pero eso no parece haber intimidado al Chapo, Joaquín El Chapo Guzman Loera. Del narcotraficante más buscado del país, El Chapo Guzman. El Chapo Guzman ha inventado y túnel subterráneo tra México y Estados Unidos. And Forbes magazine wants him for an interview because he's made their annual list of the world's billionaires. The threat of, of Chapo is everywhere. 
Can you give us an example of how you felt that? We were told that an interview we did had been recorded. And I was here in my apartment, in, my, in the safety of my own home. And Gerardo forwarded some of the recording that they got. And just to hear my voice on somebody else's tape when I didn't know, I, I freaked out. That was very scary to hear somebody else recording you without you knowing. El Chapo was listening and watching, doing whatever it takes to protect the international drug empire he built and reminding us all that he is everywhere. El Chapo has built a huge multinational criminal organization, unparalleled in history. He's like the Amazon.com of illegal drugs. This guy is a business logistic genius. If he had chosen to go the right way, he might be the head of, of Univision or a ABC or uh, another major corporation. That's how smart he is. They pretty much control the wholesale, the trafficking, and the distribution of all drugs that come into Arizona and a bigger part of the United States. His corporation acts like a computer virus, grabbing information, expanding territory, destroying enemies, and taking control. Un cartel funciona como cualquier organización, corporación. Hay un jefe que está encargado de toda la organización. Tiene varios lugartenientes y con ellos pasan órdenes a los jefes de, de plazas. With a simple formula that offers partnerships, he diffuses potential enemies and turns them into allies and sometimes even friends. Other drug dealers have tried to place their people everywhere. But what he do is he reached an agreement with the locals and he said like, okay, you continue controlling this area, but I'm above you. And with this system, it was like franchising. He's controlling everywhere. He's got agreements with people in Central America, in South America, in Europe. And even with the Chinese people, there was an agreement with, with an, a gang from China. So we could go everywhere and do a story about El Chapo. And where else did you see El Chapo's reach in the world? We also realized that the Europe market is very important for El Chapo because they pay much more for the drug than what they pay in the United States. So you're doing a documentary about a, a, a Mexican drug drug lord, and yet you'd have to travel to Colombia, to Panama, to Spain. What does this tell you about his yeah. reach around the world? Yeah, he's everywhere. And, and the amazing thing is that he also threatened people in Spain. I mean, I didn't expect the Spanish authorities to be threatened by El Chapo, but then the man who handled this operation didn't want to go on camera, and, and I finally convinced him, but he asked me not to release his name or his surname. I find it quite strange, but he said, like, you know, El Chapo is El Chapo. The key to El Chapo's success is access to the U.S. market, and he gained that through a brutal war with his rival cartel, the Zetas. All these cartels, whether it's the Zetas or whether it's Sinaloa, they murder people right and left. That's how they enforce their rules. First, he took control of the smuggling routes. Then, he found clever ways to get the drugs across one of the most militarized borders in the world. So El Chapo realized pretty early on that one of his biggest challenges was to get the drugs across into the United States. And he came up with this brilliant idea of creating tunnels. <laughs> well, the first tunnel was in the 90s. 
it was in Douglas, Arizona. Was, these are million dollar structures. He brings the miners from the state across the border and they do these humongous things. They've got concrete walls, they've got electricity. They had rails and some of them were like hydraulic rails so that they could carry massive amounts of marijuana. In Nogales, Arizona, Tiffany went underground, literally, to take a closer look at some of the 127 tunnels controlled by El Chapo. Through their investigation, the Univision reporters confirmed the location of 62 of them. This Nogales, the Plaza of Nogales, is controlled by uh, Chapo Guzman Sinaloa cartel. And there's, how common is it to see tunnels in this, oh, in this segment of the border? This, here? this right here, it's amazing it hasn't caved in on itself. Since 1990, we found well over 100 tunnels just in this area, which is less than a half a mile. And they're experts in the mining, aren't they? Absolutely. Sonora is known for mining. So what we found through our intelligence department is that a lot of these uh, people that are used to, to dig these tunnels are engineers that were laid off from the mines or may work for them still. The tunnels are the main attraction. Just days ago, on October 31st, almost as a Halloween treat, U.S. and Mexican authorities discovered another super tunnel that ran for a third of a mile between San Diego and Tijuana, the same city where Gerardo found one right in front of a police station. They take drugs from Mexico to the United States and they bring back money. Cuts. And guns. And guns. And, and guns. guns. So I actually did a story That's about gun trademark. trafficking and I went yeah. into one of these tunnels and it is incredible. I mean, it was worth over a million dollars, but they said that within a couple of weeks he would have made that money back just by bringing drugs into the United States and guns and cash down. He plays the odds too. He knows his math. He uses the tunnels for the big loads. He's completely daring. He's nuts. He clones Border Patrol cars. He gets the border patrol, the, exactly the same thing, and he passes it across the border. Utility vehicles, everything that would look normal crossing the border. And he does that for the heroin and the cocaine and the meth, which is the smaller amounts. He uses the pedestrians. From submarines to wood logs, El Chapo has shown great creativity. From an 18-wheeler uh, to aircraft to U.S. mail, UPS, FedEx, uh, to the trunk of a car, to the backpack uh, of an 18-year-old riding a bus. Chapo does not play by the rules. He has unlimited resources. Every time we put pressure on our cartels, whether it's technology, manpower, personnel on the border, they will become more creative and then there's always the chance that they will change their tactics. To maintain these sophisticated operations, El Chapo needs money, and he's got it, tons of it. He's been on the Forbes list of billionaires four times since 2009. He has a lot of protection around him, both his security guards and people that are willing to protect him because he has a lot of money and assets to throw around. Financial power gives him a long reach. From the hills of Sinaloa in Mexico, the shadow of El Chapo stretches across the oceans and deep into urban America. So the majority of the drugs that you see in Chicago are controlled by El Chapo? Mostly, yes. The DEA is going bananas in Chicago because they don't know what to do. There's so much drugs and it's so pure. The heroin they've seen is like 80, 90% pure. So everybody is smoking it, snorting it. There's no need of needles, no AIDS, no hepatitis. And it's $10 for a small bag. We got this ama amazing video where you see people standing in line, Mariana, you wouldn't believe it, in the middle of the day, 11 o'clock in the morning. And in a matter of seconds, boom, 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 boom. 15 people in that line, and everybody went, 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 went with their heroin. And all of this is controlled by El Chapo? Well, they have what they call the choke points, which is people like this African-American, his name was Kylie Murray. And everybody thought he was an NBA, you know, player, because he had the whole bling bling, you know, going on. He had the Ferrari, the Porsche. He had homes all over the place. Well, guess what? This guy was connected to El Chapo because the DEA knows. The choke point is that person 
that entity that deals with the street gangs, but also has some connection to the cartels. By targeting those people, we've got the ability to work with our friends at the police department down to the street level to interrupt the violence that the narcotics are causing. We have people in Chicago that uh, has been uh, killed, part of his organization in Chicago, so. He's everywhere. He is everywhere. He might be here, and we don't know. <laughs> Next. The legend of El Chapo is born. Alias El Chapo Guzman. For years, El Chapo built his empire in relative obscurity, killing competitors, cutting deals, and bringing tons of drugs into the U.S. Then, one day in May of 1993, all that changed. Here at the airport in Guadalajara, Mexico, a flurry of bullets killed seven people, including the Cardinal Juan Jesus Posada Ocampo. El Chapo was at the airport that day. Who really killed the cardinal is still unknown. But many originally believed the cardinal was assassinated by El Chapo. Es hasta después del asesinato del cardenal Posadas cuando las autoridades nos empiezan a decir que hay grandes capos. Y entonces nos dicen que uno se llama Joaquín Guzmán Loera, alias El Chapo Guzmán. For the first time, Mexico learned that it had its own drug lords, and one of them was Chapo Guzman. Soon, authorities said that El Chapo was actually the intended victim. The cardinal was merely caught in the crossfire. Still, he became the most wanted man in Mexico. It was the beginning of the legend of El Chapo. Using his money and influence, he miraculously slipped away by crossing the border to Guatemala. Then, on June 9th, he was quietly captured by the chief of intelligence of that country. Íbamos con toda la seguridad necesaria para poder responder, precisamente pensando en que pudiera haber algún grupo que lo tratara de rescatar. Today, Otto Pérez is the president of Guatemala. For 20 years, he never spoke about the capture. He feared for his family's safety. Mi familia, mi hija especialmente, tuvo una cuestión que nos pareció muy rara en su momento a, a nosotros y se bajaron cuatro personas armadas con fusiles y le empezaron a disparar. Ya vio todavía cuando uno levantó el fusil, se, se hizo a un lado y, y puso el acelerador. Ella recibió eh, tres impactos en, en, en su cuerpo. Gracias a Dios logró, no perdió el conocimiento. Y pudo, el, el vehículo tenía 50, 50 disparos de fusil. I had an interview with the president of Guatemala, and he said that he suspected that El Chapo Guzmán was behind an attempt to kill his daughter in Guatemala. El Chapo offered Pérez a deal. If he let him go, Chapo would give Pérez millions of dollars and tell him where to intercept five tons of cocaine. So the first thing El Chapo tries to do when he's captured is to bribe this guy. I have one million, two million. I can give you a shipment that I'm prepared to send to the United States in El Salvador, five tons of cocaine. Perez turned the bribe down. So they say no, and, and they report the, the shipment and take him to, to uh, Mexico. With his hands and feet tied, Guzman was turned over to Mexican authorities. Then, during the flight back to Mexico, El Chapo decided he had something very important to say. He said, I want to give a statement. So he called one of the offers to take note, and he mentioned all the names of officials from Mexico and Guatemala that he has bribed in the years before. 
One copy of the document that remained was handed over to Mexican prosecutors. En ese documento se hace un informe de cómo fue aquello, el interrogatorio, tal, 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 tal. Y hace una denuncia o transmite una denuncia del Chapo de que le daba algún dinero a alguien que había sido su procurador. That paper, that document that was prepared by this official was lost. It's a common theme. Anything that has to do with El Chapo, papers seem to disappear. <laughs> it happened with the investigation of the Cardinal. Over, I think, a thousand documents went missing. Nobody seems to know what happened to them. So it seems that wherever he's involved, things get lost, mysteriously get lost. And I guess is a lot of people, it's in their best interest that he never get caught. Ironically, the only time El Chapo was arrested was over a crime he didn't commit. El Chapo was first sent to a strict penitentiary where he couldn't even talk to other inmates. He complained and got moved to the Puente Grande prison in Jalisco. With bribes and intimidation, he turned the jail into a five-star hotel full of special privileges. Le permitía la entrada de prostitutas, le permitía la entrada de Viagra, porque el Chapo Guzmán consumía Viagra, cocaína, y, este, y le permitían, no solo eso, le permitían también tener acceso sexual a eh, reclusas que estaban ahí. One of them, Zulema Hernández, became his girlfriend. And in one of the many love letters El Chapo sent her, he told her that after eight years behind bars, he would soon be free again. Were there other prison officials or guards that were aware of this and allowed this to happen because they were paid bribes or intimidated in some way? It seems unlikely that he just got into a, <laughs> a dirty clothespin <laughs> and got rolled out of the prison without a fair number of people having been paid off to help him escape. And to this day, he still eludes those trying to capture him. I had two crews in Guadalajara. Uh -huh. When Univision News managing editor Maria Martinez Enao went back to Guadalajara to report for this program, she was reminded of El Chapo's far-reaching influence. So I'm in Guadalajara with two crews. One was working on some other story had to do with drug trafficking in which a Puerto Rican national was in a jail. So I'm interviewing his lawyer. And the lawyer says to me, you haven't been honest, have you, to me? And I said, I'm sorry, honest about what? Why do you have a crew in the Guadalajara airport investigating El Chapo? And I said, oh, while well, we're working on a Chapo special, how are you, are you one of El Chapo's lawyers? And he said, I'm his friend. Once again, El Chapo had eyes and ears everywhere. When we come back, how the world's most powerful drug lord evaded capture, and a surprising connection El Chapo has to the United States. While El Chapo's drug empire circles the globe, he has a special relationship with the United States. I see young people dying from heroin overdoses, and I see gang members shooting it out, killing innocent people because they want to control the market because it's the way they make their money. And I see Chapo sitting on a mountain in Mexico counting his money. We look around Los Angeles, New York, Miami, Houston, many cities across the United States the major, what I call, first level of wholesale distribution, multi-kilo distribution, that's controlled by the Mexican cartels. In 2009, the DEA found El Chapo Sinaloa cartel operating in 64 American cities. But his ties to the U.S. run even deeper. We unearthed a driver's license with his picture. We saw it was like, that's his picture. It was An American like, driver's license? Yes, from California. 
it's his picture with another name and another address, but it's it's his picture. And he used it for buying two cars. He bought two uh, Corvettes. To bribe some commandantes in Mexico. To bribe Mexican generals. Bribery is key to El Chapo's success at remaining free. He's able to certainly corrupt officials. He's able to intimidate government officials. And that might explain what happened to a Mexican general who tried to capture El Chapo. Yeah, there was a, there was a military th that uh, worked in Sinaloa, in the place where El Chapo controls. And he was fighting against El Chapo. He actually take his uh, militars to the hometown of El Chapo. He landed his helicopters near El Chapo's mother's home. So the Chapo's mother was really pissed off and she put a complaint on the human rights. After three years fighting against El Chapo, they sent him to Russia. And he believes it was because he was getting too close to El Chapo that he was sent to Russia. Well, you know, a military won't ever tell you that, but he said, like, well, I have to do what my bosses said, but I'm sure he was not happy with that. And 45 minutes, he was talking about El Chapo without saying El Chapo. So he said, like, the man you're talking about, the boss of the cartel, the one who controls the area, but never mentioned El Chapo with his name. We have talked here about El Chapo as a businessman, El Chapo as a genius for controlling markets, but we have to say also that most of, of the violence in, in, in Mexico is happening because of his uh, planning as a micromanager of how to kill his enemies. Even with a reward of $5 million from the U.S. and $2 million from Mexico, nobody has turned him in. Chapo Guzman remains a a person that's most wanted from not only DEA but all other American authorities. And it seems the Mexican government goes after his competitors more forcefully. I mean, it's, it's such a coincidence that the nemesis of El Chapo are being killed or arrested. Right. El Chapo's competition is being brought down. Hmm. How come El Chapo's in his organization, which is the strongest, and nothing's happening to them? An analysis of arrests by NPR found that even though El Chapo's cartel is the largest, it only accounts for 12% of all federal cartel arrests in Mexico. It might be a good strategy to go after the Zetas first and then send a law. There's a commitment on the part of the Mexican government at the federal level to go after and destroy all of the powerful, big, organized crime groups. You can't just leave one left standing. But there is another, more sinister idea about why El Chapo has been able to escape the law. People that follow his life believe that he had an agreement with the United States anti-narcotics uh, agencies. Yo me pongo a seguir el caso de Vicente Zambada, eh, el hijo del Mayo Zambada, en Chicago. Y descubro que su defensa empieza a fraguar, a articular un argumento insólito en la defensa del joven capo. Y era que el gobierno de Estados Unidos no podía juzgarlo por el tráfico de drogas porque el gobierno de Estados Unidos le daba permiso para el tráfico de drogas. The son of El Chapo's partner on trial in Chicago for drug trafficking claimed in court that El Chapo has a deal with the DEA. And in the court in Chicago, the lawyers for this guy said he has immunity. The United States government has an agreement with El Chapo Guzman. Former DEA administrator Robert Bonner denies there's a deal with El Chapo. It's ridiculous. There is no agreement between Chapo Guzman and the DEA. D the, nothing the DEA would more like to see than the capture of El Chapo uh, and ideally his extradition to the United States. But it wouldn't be the first time the DEA worked with drug cartels. In the 90s, they made agreements with Colombian cartels. When they were fighting the cartels in Colombia, the government and the DA made some uh, questionable agreements with the cartels to destroy the Medellin cartel. But of course, DEA will take information from uh, one cartel and use it against another cartel. We did that in Colombia. Once the Colombian government said, enough is enough, 
It took them 10 years to destroy the two most powerful drug cartels the world had ever seen. They went after the Medellin cartel first, then they focused on the Cali cartel, ultimately locating and killing Pablo Escobar. So how would you compare Pablo Escobar to El Chapo? El Chapo has more money to pay bribes than, than Pablo Escobar. The Medellin cartel paid bribes for getting some specific favors. My impression is that El Chapo pay monthly bribes. El Chapo is a bigger player in this arena. Uh, Pablo Escobar only controls cocaine. El Chapo controls every drug that you can imagine. And he is in Europe, he's in Africa, he's in the United States, and, and, and all the Latin America. He's bigger. He's a global, he's a global player. He is. Others think that the governments of both the U.S. and Mexico are simply not doing their best to capture the CEO of crime. All Mexico has to do is look to the way Colombia took care of business. And yes, the U.S. had to help. Mexico cannot do it alone. The U.S. has to be involved. If you cut the head off of a snake, the snake is not going to exist anymore. It's interlinked, like the CEO of a corporation. If that CEO did not exist, it's gonna frustrate that organization, which will ensue instability. A great instability, and for us, the best attack is when they're vulnerable. It's important for us to take people off the street corner that are involved in violence, but we can't stop there. We've got to link it back to the people that transport, stash it, are accountable for it, and we've got to follow that all the way back to the border, even though we're 2,000 miles off the border, and work with our counterparts in Mexico along the border to hold Chapo responsible. You know, if we paid attention to the poison that Chapo Guzman is sending to the United States, um, we shouldn't tolerate it. While he sends his poison to the United States, he also sent precious cargo here. In 2011, his wife, Emma Coronel, gave birth to twin girls at this hospital near Los Angeles, California. El Chapo knows how the system in the United States works. He sends his wife, who's a U.S. Yes. citizen, to give birth to twins in California. So he's got these two girls, which are U.S. citizens, by the way, that can be U.S. presidents, mind you. He, in a way, is taking advantage of the American way to make his children be American citizens, laughing at us the whole time. Father, folk hero, drug lord, killer, the many faces of El Chapo, the most wanted, yet the most elusive criminal in the world.